Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad wa ajjal farajahum wa lana adaa'ahum ajma'een. Some time ago I gave a short lecture about Imam Zaman al-Islam about the misconceptions and doubts that people have about Imam Zaman al-Islam. There was one misconception which I didn't fully cover due to time constraints, but I'll finish that off now and then move on to the rest of the topic of my lecture, which was more about the, the army of 313 followers of Imam Zaman al-Islam. Who are they? and also how to become one of them. You see, when Imam Zaman al-Islam comes, we are told many times that Imam Zaman al-Islam will bring the true Islam. What does this mean? Does this mean that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu who Allah sent to teach the true Islam, didn't teach the true Islam? Of course he taught the true Islam. But over time, over these hundreds of years that have passed, people have come and toyed around with Islam. If Islam was sent down like this, they've come and crossed out this line, added in this line here, changed these letters here to change the whole meaning of the sentence. They've come and changed Islam, hidden parts, played with parts, for their personal gain, for political gain, for financial gain. They've played with Islam and changed it over time. It's become now, so many people, so many Muslims I see, they don't know the difference between something that is religious and something that is due to their, their culture, their community, their country that they're from. People are mixing the issues up. When Imam Zaman al-Islam comes, he will purify Islam. All of the dirt and dust that has gathered on Islam, he'll come and wipe it all off, all of it, and present to people the true Islam. That's what Imam Zaman al-Islam It will be such, in Revayat it says this, that it will be such that when Imam Zaman al-Islam comes and brings the true Islam, people will say, what? Is Islam this easy? Why did the ulama make it so hard for us? Why did the scholars make it so hard for us? Some people say religion makes life hard for you anyway. Why? Because in religion you're not allowed to do certain things and you're forced to do certain things. Well, let me ask you a question. These, these rules, these laws, which you call a restriction, You should be looking at these in a different way. What kind of way? Imagine a, someone who's training for the Olympics. They have the strength. For example, let's talk about Usain Bolt. Usain Bolt is the fastest 100 meter, 100 meter sprinter in the world. Right? How does he do it? Is it because he sits around on the coach playing games and, I don't know, going out and eating whatever food he likes. No, he has restrictions on him. In his timetable it says, from this time to this time you must train. From, you're not allowed to eat these things. You, you have to eat more of this or less of this. Why? So that he can train to get to that, that power that he has. To have that potential that he has. He has a certain set of restrictions to reach a potential. Now, Allah, who created us, obviously is more aware of our potential. And he's put these restrictions in. These certain laws, you're not allowed to eat certain things. Why? Because I know they're bad for you. Science might not know now, but in a few hundred years, scientists will finally catch on. The same way 1,000 years ago, for example, nobody knew alcohol was bad. But now there's so many doctors saying don't drink alcohol. Now isn't the time or place for me to go into this topic because I have, to be honest, a set thing here to talk about. But we know this, and if you go to search us on YouTube, on Google, YouTube, wherever you want, you'll see that this is true. 
So these restrictions, which Allah has set down for us, are not restrictions. In fact, they're made to make our life easier, to make it easier for us to live by following these things. So, in conclusion to the issue of misconceptions about Imam Zaman al-Islam, I must say that we should not fall prey to the plans of the enemies of Islam. They don't come out right and tell us Imam Zaman al-Islam, it's not good for him to come, he's going to ruin life for you. They don't come out and say this, because if they were to say that, if anybody in their right mind would turn around and say, this is an enemy, an enemy of Imam Zaman al-Islam. But they give us, they feed us, they, they throw us these little leaves. They feed us these little bits of information, planting seeds in our head. Like Imam Zaman al-Islam's Adolat will be so difficult. Imam Zaman al-Islam, when he comes, he will have a big war. Every man, woman and child must be ready. And these are all making us scared. We're thinking, what's the point in Imam Zaman al-Islam coming there? I'm not going to pray for him. I'm just going to sit here and do what? Carry on with my life. Even if we don't outwardly say this, even if we go to the mosque and do our Allahumma ajjalla balayk al-faraj, when we've got that doubt in the back of our mind telling us that when Imam Zaman al-Islam comes, our, our, our life is going to be difficult, then who are we fooling? Is our Allahumma ajjalla balayk al-faraj for the person sitting next to us in the mosque to see us doing it, or is it for God to see us? Because if it's for God to see us, He sees what's in our heart. So, going back to the army of 313 followers, again, I know I said I was finished with the misconceptions, but here is a small one in itself, calling it an army, an army of 313 followers of Imam Zaman Nisa. You see, the problem is, these days, for, in fact, for much of history, when you look at armies, what do you see? You see people, many people, a lot of them even maybe illiterate, maybe don't have much uh, of a moral or, or, or ethics or anything. These people going around killing, looting, abusing people, stealing, disrespecting people, misusing their powers that they're given, these soldiers and these armies. So immediately, the moment you hear Imam Zaman al-Islam's army, you think killing, violence. But this is wrong. This, when we say this army of Imam Zaman al-Islam, we mean these commanders of Imam Zaman al-Islam. This army, yes, they will be there for the initial, very short if war, if you can even call it a war. Which I mentioned, only 1,400 people approximately will be killed out of the over 6 billion people on the earth. Yes, that will be the duty of this army. But after that, this army, their duty is to form the government, government of Imam Mahdi al-Islam. These are soldiers so strong that they can't be bought, that they can't be tempted, that you can't slip them some money in a brown paper bag and ask them to do something. These are soldiers, people like Malika Ashtar. Malika Ashtar was a commander of Imam Ali salam. But despite being a commander of Imam Ali salam, he was also a representative. He was also in charge of whenever there was a problem, that people would come to him and he would represent Imam Ali salam. This is the 313 soldiers of Imam Zaman al salam are not militant people running around with AK 47s. No. These are representatives of Imam Zaman al-Islam. People who wouldn't step, a single step out of line of Imam Zaman al-Islam. People who would carry out Imam Zaman al-Islam's order to the very full stop of it. Wouldn't change a single letter of that order. These are the followers of Imam Zaman al-Islam. So I want to describe to you what is it that makes someone one of these followers? What is the primary characteristic of these followers that separates them from the rest? We have many people that serve Imam Zaman 
But what is a true, obedient follower? It comes down to ibadat and etaat. Ibadat means worship. Etaat means obedience. To explain these two words to you, I'll go through a couple of examples through history, starting with the beginning of time, where everything started to go wrong. And that was with Eblis, Shaitan, Satan, the devil. As many of you know, the devil was one of the best worshippers of God. He used to worship God. He was one of God's best servants. Until the time came where God said, okay, I'm going to create Adam. Adam is created out of mud. He's going to be my representative on the earth. I want you to bow down to him. And the devil turned around and said, why? I am made of fire. He is made of clay or earth. Fire is better than clay or earth. So why should I bow down to him? And God said that because it's my command to you. And then Eblis, or the, the Satan, turned around and said that, okay, I'll worship you in the in however you want me to worship you. I'll worship you in the best way. Just excuse me this one thing. I don't want to bow down to him. Imam Ali al-Islam says that when Eblis said this, he means it. Eblis could have worshipped Allah in the best way possible and had many times before. There are many examples of his worship. But Allah said, no, I don't want your thousands of years long prayers. I don't want these long worship, extravagant worship from you. I just want you to do this one thing, bow down to Adam. And Iblis said, no. He was, he was ready to do ibadat, but he wasn't ready to do etat. He was ready to worship Allah, but he was not ready to obey Allah. Second example, we go to the time of the Prophet's Shahadat. Imam Ali salam was told before the Prophet told Imam Ali salam before his Shahadat that look, Ya Ali, after I am martyred, the Khilafat, the ruling, is yours, but people will take it from you. People will come and steal this from you. Imam Ali sometimes around says, okay, well, can I not get it back from them? Can I not fight these people? And the Prophet said, yes, you can, under the condition that you have 40 followers, and only under this condition. Imam Ali turns to the Prophet and says, well, how do I know if I have 40 followers? How do I know who these followers are? And the Prophet turns and says to Imam Ali Tell the people to meet you in the mosque the next day, having shaved their heads and wearing white robes. If 40 people turn up, then fight those who have taken your right. If not, then you are not allowed to rise up. So Imam al salam people often say Imam al salam was so strong, he lifted the, 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 the door of Khaybar, he killed all of the warriors of the polytheists, why didn't he fight up, fight against these people? It obviously shows that Imam al was pleased with those who took his right. No. You are severely misinformed. Imam al was given the permission to fight on the condition that he had 40 followers. What happened? He went to people's doors, he knocked on their house's doors and told them, look, you know I'm the right leader. It was the very first thing the Prophet preached. He preached it throughout his whole life. Everybody knows this. So come tomorrow and defend, stick up for the truth. And the people said, yeah, we'll come, we'll come. The next day, my son was in the masjid and he, after morning prayer, the time that he was supposed to be there and the people were supposed to come as well and only a few people turned up, only a handful of people. Again, the next day he knocks on people's doors, the third day, carries on, nobody comes. And when I some sees that, nobody wants to, wants the justice, nobody wants me to rule. These people who 
are happy doing the ibadat, the prayer, the fasting, are not happy doing ita'at of the imam of their time. Imam Ali al Islam again in the Battle of Safin against Muawiyah. The people, rather than following their Imam and fighting against Muawiyah, they say, Oh, but the enemy's tribes have held up Qurans on the spears. We can't fight against the Quran. These people, again, not ready to do it at And it meant that Imam Ali al was not able to. Re- Restore all of the problems that had occurred from the first three Khalifs because he could not get the Khalifat, Khilafat back. Imam Hassan salam, when he went to fight against Muawiyah, two thirds of his army turned away from him because their commander was bought. Imam Sadr salam, during the time of Imam Sadr a man from Khurasan came to Imam Sadr and said to him, Ya ibn Rasulullah, why don't you rise up against the, the Khalif? The, we know that the right belongs to you, why don't you do it? And Imam Sadr says, I don't have enough followers. The man takes out a big pile of letters and says, look at all these letters from the people of Khurasan. They are all ready to fight for you. All of them in Khurasan. And Imam Sadr al says, okay, that's nice. And the man says, what do you mean? They're ready to fight for you. These are their letters. And Imam Sadr al says, okay. So how's life in Khurasan? <laughs> he diverts the conversation. They start talking about a completely separate topic. During their conversation, one of the Imam's companions comes into the, comes into the Imam's house and he says, Salam alaikum, Salam alaikum. And the Imam asks his companion to go and stand in the oven. The oven was one of the big, very big oven. Back in those days, they used to have these big ovens. Uh, he says, go and stand in the oven. And yes, the oven was on. It was not switched off. The oven was on. The fire was raging. Go and stand in there. The Imam's companion says, okay. And he goes. Stands in the oven, shuts the door. The man from Khurasan is, 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 is looking at the oven, thinking, what's going on? So the Imam can, carries on asking him, says, okay, so how, how's your farm back in Khurasan? And the man's just looking. And the Imam says, you know, you're farming, you're a farmer, how are your sheep, crops, how are they? The man's just looking. And some time passes. <laughs> then the Imam says to the man, Okay, come on. He takes the man to the oven, opens the door, and sees that the Imam's companion is just sitting there doing some zikr, some du'a, some prayer of some sort, with the fire raging around him. Completely untouched. Then the Imam says to the man from Khurasan, How many people like this do you have in Khurasan waiting? to stand up and rise up with me. The man says none. Some of you might think, for example, how can I how can I prove myself? Like yeah, over there I would have said, yeah, I'll I'll go stand in the oven. I'll you know I'll I would have done that, yeah, if the Imam told me to I would have done that. How can you prove yourself now? Some people ask, the Imam's not around, how can I prove myself to the Imam? The one hasn't asked me to do anything. So I'll give you a very modern story. We all know Ayatollah Sistani. Everyone's heard of Ayatollah Sistani. Ayatollah Sistani's father he wanted to see Imam Zaman Nisan. So what he did was he made a, a, a vow that for 40 Friday nights, that's, that's Thursday night really, it's the night of Friday, for 40 Thursday nights, Shabbat John there, <coughs> He would go to the mosque, and one, one of the mosques in the city, and he would uh, do ziyarat al-Ashura. So he did this. And one of the last few nights of these 40 nights, he was in the mosque doing his ziyarat al-Ashura, and suddenly he sees a light. 
from one of the most windows out in the road somewhere. He says, it's not a normal light. So he gets up and goes towards the light, goes out of the mosque, leaves the mosque, towards where he'd seen the light. And he sees it's coming from one of the houses. So he goes up to the house, he knocks on the front door, very curious, what is this strange light? He knocks on the house door, and the door opens. He walks inside, and he sees Imam Zaman standing beside a body in a shroud. And he immediately knows it's Imam Zaman he, sa he says to him, well, what are you doing here? What, what's going on? And Imam Zaman turns to him and says to him, this is a woman who has just passed away. I have come to do her shroud for her, her, get her ready for her burial. She doesn't have anyone to do it for her. This woman, for the past seven years since the ban of hijab in Iran, she has not left her house once. At that time, there was a ban of hijab in Iran, where if you left your house with hijab, if you left your house wearing hijab, the police would come and put you in prison or make you take your hijab off or whatever. For that reason, she did not leave her house for seven years. She did not leave her house once. If she needed anything, someone would bring it for her. She would not leave her house once. She, you could say she had imprisoned herself in her house. So the Imam says to him that, and I had regularly visited this woman because she was doing her duty. Her duty at that point in time was to follow her religion. And her religion told her to uphold her hijab. And she did this. And so I would visit her regularly. And had you done your duty, had you been like this woman and done your duty, I would also visit you. There would be no need for you to go to the masjid and do this ziyarat al-Ashura every week and trying to come and find me. You wouldn't need to find me or search for me. I would come to you. This is a modern day example. So many of you are probably now sitting there thinking, okay, so it is possible to see our Imam. Not even see our Imam, but for our Imam to visit us. And it is possible to be a true follower of him. But, okay, I'm not a woman in Iran at a time of a hijab ban. So what do I have to do to see Imam Zaman Islam? What is my duty? What am I doing wrong? I'll go through these now. I'll give a few examples. Remember I said about Eta'at and Ibadat? And how Ibadat is good? But etaat is what comes first. Obedience is what comes first over worship. I'll give you a few examples now so that you can then apply this rule to things in your life and see what you should be giving priority to. For example, there are some people who do du'a kumail on a Thursday night. And they do, they stay up doing all these du'as and salat and, I don't know, mustahabbat and, 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 and whatever. But they miss their morning prayer because of all this. Because they didn't get to bed in time. So they miss their morning prayer. So yes, they did a whole lot of ibadat. Yeah, that's good. But no, it's not good if you if you can't do etarat. You are, the etarat here was to do your morning prayer. God never said it was wajib to do dark mail. God never said it was wajib to do salat and lay. He said it was wajib to do your morning prayer. Another example. I'll give money to charity, I'll donate thousands of pounds to charity. But I won't pay my khums for zakat. Yes, you've done ibadat, you've given money to charity, that's a form of worship, but you haven't been obedient because Allah said, pay your khums and your zakat. It could even be that your khums for zakat was something like five pounds, and that year you gave a thousand pounds to charity. Why didn't you give that five pounds with the intention of it being khums? 
Why didn't you simply just take five minutes to calculate it and pay it? This is choosing about that or about it right. Or you'll go to, I don't know, Joma prayer every Friday. You go to Joma prayer, you don't mind Friday leaving work to go to Joma prayer, but any other day of the week because you're at work and you don't want your colleagues to see, you you leave prayer to when you get home. Leave it till after sunset, it's okay. As long as my, my colleagues don't see me at work. Yeah, you've done about that with going to your drama prayer. But it's useless if you haven't done your etaat, which is doing your, your wajib prayer, your compulsory prayer. Or, this is something quite common, I'll do du'a and niyaz and, uh, I don't know, whatever forms of worship to try and get a job. You're praying to God, oh Allah, please give me this job. If I get this job, I'll, I'll I don't know, I'll give 500 pounds to charity, I'll do um, zero to ashra for 40 days, I'll do whatever. When you get the job, your boss says, okay, you, congratulations, you've got the job. She's a woman. And you put forward your hand and shake your hand. What was the necessity to do that? Yes, you did a whole lot about that. You said, if I get the job, I'm going to do this, this, and this. But why did you need to shake a woman's hand who is not lawful for you? That's not at all right. Or, for example, some people, they do Nawaz Ashab, Salat al Night prayer. Extra night prayer they do. But, they don't care looking at anyone. They'll look at any woman that is on the road. They, that, they just don't mind. See, the, the thing is, is that you're... Night prayer is a must have. It's a good thing to do. It's not wajib, it's not, it's not obligatory for you, but it's a good thing. But this looking at women on the road who are unlawful for you is haram. You're not allowed to do it. This, if you do that, then you're not doing it right. If you look at these people on the road, you're not doing it right. But if you do the namaz shab, Fine, it could be about that, that's fine. But it doesn't it doesn't mean much when you're doing from the other side all these sins. Or some girls walking around, you know, I'll wear hijab, fine, I'll wear the headscarf. But I'll use my face as a makeup exhibition. You can see all the latest brands, just come and look at my face. Or I'll wear this, this cloth here, this, I don't know, tight jeans to accentuate my slender lines. You're wearing the headscarf, fine. If you think that's worshipping God, fine. But where's your obedience to God? Why are you wearing this kind of clothing for, or walking around as if you're some kind of mobile perfume shop that everyone can smell you? I'm not saying walk around not having had a shower for a week and smelling really bad, no. But there's no need to try and attract people by wearing excess perfume. Or for example, this is a classic one. I will buy halal food for my family from the halal shop owned by the pious Muslim down the road using haram food using haram money that I earned from my haram job or using money that I earned from cheating people or overcharging people. This is a classic. Buying halal food, food that is labelled halal, which you're convincing yourself you're buying halal food, but you're buying it with haram money. This is not halal food. This is haram food. Anything bought with haram money is haram. Yes, you've done about that, choosing to go and buy halal rather than haram, but if you're buying it with haram money, that's haram. So you haven't done it at there. These are just a few examples so we can think and reflect and, and understand, okay, when I'm faced with this decision in life, I've got to just take a moment, step back and think, okay, is this at or not? Maybe, you're, maybe it's time for, for family dinner and you're sitting there on YouTube watching an Islamic lecture 
Your mom's calling you down for dinner. I don't know. Ahmad, come down. It's dinner time. Instead of going down and having family dinner, which is can be considered as compulsory to spend time with your family, Salaylahim, you're fooling yourself thinking that, yeah, I'll just watch five more minutes of this, this video. It's, a, it's an Islamic lecture, it's a good thing. Now, woe to those people who spend that five minutes not watching an Islamic lecture, watching, I don't know, woman on the tram or something, some internet sensation video like this. Waste of time. The last important point which I want to touch up on is praying for Imam Zaman praying for his arrival. Now, when I say praying for Imam Zaman arrival, it's not going to benefit Imam Zaman if we pray for his arrival. Because Imam Zaman his duty, he does his duty, regardless of whether it's to come and save the world, or to just be patient. Imam Zaman al-Islam does his duty. But it's us that need Imam Zaman al-Islam to come. Why? Because Imam Zaman al-Islam, when he comes, not only will he sort out our religion and our social problems, but also our lives, also our uh, even our financial problems, our economical, uh, economic problems, and our afterlife. Next time you see a friend doubting Imam Zaman al-Islam, or they come and they ask a question with regards to this, explain to them that, no, this isn't, this isn't the case. Imam Zaman al-Islam is like this, this and this. Tell everyone about Imam Zaman al-Islam, who Imam Zaman al-Islam really is. So I pray that, inshallah, we can all take something away from this and change our attitude with regards to Imam Zaman al-Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.